coming up this week. Taking the sting out of Mexico's creepy crawlies. So he's about to milk the snake. Yes, yes, yes. Look. Huge yeah. venom. That's the venom. Yeah, that's the venom. Rediscovering Scotland's mysterious past. We don't have a, a name for the tribes of people that lived here, and that's perhaps part of the mystery. And we check out the latest wines erupting onto the scene in the volcanic Azores. You can taste the, the sea. The texture of the, of the wine. Yes, you can taste the sea. For generations, snakes, scorpions, and spiders have been important mystical and religious figures here in Mexico. And traveling around the country, you can't escape being reminded of that. But in reality, some are very dangerous. Around four and a half million people are bitten by snakes alone around the world every year. And over half of those bites can lead to serious injuries or worse. And climate change combined with accelerated urban development means that more and more people are coming into contact with things that can bite, with scientists predicting that the number of cases can rise even higher. To get an idea of what's out there here in Mexico, I've come to a park near the capital to meet Diego Barrales, who's become a Twitter sensation. He's the go-to guy when it comes to identifying potential danger. Every day, hundreds of pictures are sent to him from worried travelers looking for reassurance after a close encounter or bite from a spider, scorpion, or snake. Hi, Diego. Hi, Eva. Hey. How are you? I'm great. What deadly creature are we looking for here? Oh, we are looking for spiders and scorpions. They are quite common uh, in this part of Mexico. And it doesn't take long to find a scorpion. Even though it's dark, they show up with a UV light, which is far more effective than using a traditional torch. And even though the scorpions you'll find here in Mexico aren't as deadly as some that you might find across the Middle East, they can still give you a very painful sting. Oh, hey, wow. We put it in there. Here he goes. Diego, you've become quite a bit of a social media celebrity. How did that happen? is because people want to know more about these animals. Uh, of course, people are, are afraid of these animals, so they are looking uh, for help. These animals are most often seen as horrible creatures, but uh, I think that through the work I have been doing in the Twitter account and the uh, Instagram account, people are starting to see these creatures in a different way. Despite Diego's best efforts, more people are bitten here in Mexico than anywhere else in the world. Which is part of the reason why the country has developed one of the most advanced anti-venom programs anywhere. So I'm off to meet Dr. Alagon, one of the world's leading authorities on anti-venom, who has promised me a date with a potentially deadly rattlesnake. So so scary looking. Antivenom is made up from antibodies that can neutralize a potentially harmful or lethal sting or bite. And the only way to create it is to start by collecting the venom in the first place. So he's about to milk the snake? Yes, yeah, yeah, look. Yeah. Huge fans! Oh Did you see the, the venom. yellowish venom? That's the venom. Yeah, that's the venom. That snake does not look happy. Dr. Alagon's team regularly extract venom from some of the world's most dangerous snakes and scorpions in a process called milking. The venom will then be used to create antibodies which will counter the poison. But more on that in a moment. So that's not very much, is it? Well, actually, for us, it's quite a bit, you know? I mean, it's 
very concentrated and, uh, and potent. Ten years ago, Dr. Alagon bought this ranch on the outskirts of Mexico City, where he keeps the animals that have the key to the success of the anti-venom process. And they are these horses. What's the link between horses and anti-venom? Because, as you can see, horses, they behave well, you know, they are large animals, so they can produce lots of blood, and then you can purify the antibodies mm -hmm. that make the anti-venom, okay, from the horse blood. The process is a slow but very controlled one. Over a period of six months, a horse is injected with a small but increasing amount of snake, scorpion or spider venom that allows the horse to build venom neutralizing antibodies in its blood, which means they become immune to that particular venom. These antibodies are then extracted by Dr. Alagon's cowboys turned scientists, which they then use to create life-saving serum. And the, the blood will be collected in a bag and then uh, it will be hung uh, uh, so that the, the cells, the blood cells, deposit in the bottom and the plasma that contains the, uh, the antibodies from which antivenoms are, mm -hmm. are made remains on the top. How much antivenom do these horses actually produce? Well, it will produce an average of 2,000 vials of antivenom with one donation. That's for scorpions. For snakes, you only get 200 uh, vials. Okay. Those are still pretty powerful numbers. Yes, yes. So what would you say to people who, you know, who think that this might not be the right thing to do to horses, to these beautiful animals? Well, I will say that this Horses have, have been used for antivenom production for more than 130 years. And as you can see, well, they, they are well treated, well fed. And I will say that that is more suffering, mm. okay, uh, 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 saving lives. And, and, mm. and so far there is not an alternative for that. If you think about it, each of these horses could potentially save thousands of lives. Th thousands of lives, literally. Yes, yeah. yes. Amazing. <laughs> if you do get bitten, the best advice is to not attempt to remove the venom yourself by sucking the site of the wound, but seek medical help immediately. Don't drink caffeine or alcohol, both of which could speed up the rate at which your body absorbs the poison. And try to remember the color and shape of the creature that's bitten you, as that will help medical staff to treat you quickly and effectively. So since the use of anti-venom has become more widespread in Mexico, how have the numbers changed? Yeah, mortality in the case of scorpions has decreased by 86% and in the case of a snake by 63%. Oh, that's a huge difference. Huge difference. Well, if you're thinking of coming here, don't let the idea of a few creepy crawlies put you off. There are loads of outdoor adventures to consider. Here are just a few. History buffs will find exploring the remains of Mexico's ancient civilizations irresistible. The Mayan ruins of Palenque are thought to be well over a thousand years old, with hundreds of buildings spread over six square miles. Or for those with a really adventurous side, how about cave diving in the Yucatan Peninsula? Descend into one of the thousands of naturally formed flooded sinkholes called cenotes and there is a world to discover underwater. Cenotes often begin with one large chamber, which branches off into vast cave systems. There is thought to be a cenote here for every skill level of diver. And how about mountain climbing in central Mexico? At around 20,000 feet altitude, there are spectacular mountains here for expert climbers, but even novices can scale them with an experienced guide. Treks to La Malinche Volcano can also be combined with visits to the stunning pyramids of Teotihuacan. Still to come on The Travel Show. We enter the world of ancient Scottish architecture. 
the current academic thinking is that they were houses. Houses with five metres thick walls and 13 metres high. Cheers. And try a volcanic tipple in the Azores. Wow, that's intense. So don't go away. While I was around Mexico City, there was one place I just had to check out. Within the waterways of Xochimilco lies a local legend. Step onto an island here and you will find, among a few small huts, a place which some say is cursed. Welcome to the island of Dolls. This strange little place has become a massive tourist attraction but its origins are actually pretty dark. So around 70 years ago, a young girl drowned nearby. And so the island's owner started placing dolls around here for her spirit to play with. But the story gets much weirder than that. After filling the entire island with dolls, the owner himself died in the exact same spot as the young girl. It is said he spent 50 years adding to the collection of dolls here before his own mysterious death in 2001. Definitely not the kind of place I'd want to spend the night alone. So it's probably for the best then that you can't actually sleep here but you can visit the island as part of a day tour of Xochimilco's waterways. It's not one for the faint-hearted. I've never been to a place like this before. And with good reason, it's absolutely terrifying. It's a great natural setting for a horror movie. Standing in the midst of the stunning Scottish wilderness for the past 2,000 years, these mysterious stone structures are a symbol of Scotland's unique archaeological past. Known as a brock, the exact purpose of these iconic Iron Age ruins is still unknown. However, a group of experimental archaeologists believe that an ambitious project to build a brock from scratch could finally help us to better understand their past. A broch is a huge Iron Age structure made completely of dry stone with walls five metres thick. We don't have a, a name for the tribes of people that lived here and that's perhaps part of the mystery of what a broch was used for. The current academic thinking is that they were houses. Houses with five metres thick walls and 13 metres high. It, still after hundreds of years of archaeology, we're not entirely sure. We have a modern perception of what buildings are. The most complete brock still standing is Musa. Musa brock is the most intact brock that we have. It does, of course, have a secondary structure from a later occupation phase built inside it. But we do have a good sense of what a brock may have been in its completed form. Dry stone towers of that size, and you especially see it with Musa, is it's a difficult endeavor to begin with to build one. The fact that they have lasted as long as they have, the fact that they go through several phases of occupation uh, spanning somewhere around a thousand years is attractive to a, a heritage tourist. The Caithness Brock Project is an experimental archaeological initiative aiming to build a full-scale brock from scratch using traditional methods. It is a hugely ambitious undertaking as so little is known about these mysterious buildings. I think it's a very adventurous idea to build a brock. It will teach us an incredible amount about how to go about building a dry stone, to build a structure that's so large. And the design of our brock, we've tried to base it as much as we can on archaeological evidence. I think what we really hope to achieve is a more thorough understanding of brocks and how they were built might kind of play into ideas of, of why they were built as well. So as we go through the process of constructing a brock, 
then maybe we'll get a better insight into the minds of Brock builders in the past as well, because there's so many unanswered questions about the Iron Age. How did Iron Age societies work? How did they kind of revolve around the Brocks, or how did Brocks revolve around Iron Age societies? The building of the Sprock will be as, as much of an attraction as visiting as a complete structure. The most Brocks are found right here in Caithness, so we like to think that Caithness is the home of the Brock. The Caithness Brock project is currently searching for the ideal site to begin the construction of their Brock. And they estimate it could be between three and five years before they finally achieve their goal of bringing this enigmatic building back to the Scottish countryside. Next up, we are off to the Azores, where new wine routes are being developed across six of the nine major islands, following a renaissance in the unique practice of growing grapes across lava fields. We sent Catmo to find out more. There it is. On a map, Pico Island is pretty much a dot in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Formed 300,000 years ago, it's the youngest volcanic island in the Azores archipelago. Pico last erupted 300 years ago, and it explains why the land is so rugged. Tourists come to hike its unique landscape alongside whale watching and dolphin spotting. But I'm here for its volcanic wines. In fact, UNESCO has granted Pico World Heritage status for its vineyard culture and I'm starting to see why. So see, we just pick a grape. Fortunato is always last to harvest on the island because he needs to wait till his grapes reach a higher sugar level, almost like raisins. What does that tell you? It tells me the probably alcohol that I'm gonna have. So now it's around 13, so I need to be at least 18. So it needs a bit more sunshine? Yes. Now we're going to go all the way up to the windmill, so... So you grew up in and around these beautiful vineyards? Well, beautiful at that time, it didn't look that beautiful <laughs> because we were working around here and it's crazy. And, uh, and yeah, sometimes I would do what we're doing right now. <laughs> <Just> hide. <laughs> hide. <laughs> he makes a very old type of wine, which almost disappeared entirely after a plague decimated the vineyards across the island in the late 19th century. If it wasn't for my dad to continue this, uh, we would not have Passado wine today. The Passado wine, like in the old days and starting in 1460, uh, it's definitely the, the most iconic wine of Pico. That's the wine that you used to go to popes and the emperors and kings and the Tsars. And just run me through the mechanics of, of how these grapes even thrive to begin with. Each corral, which is these four mm -hmm. stone walls that we have around us, this creates a micro-perfect microclimate. And if you touch this rock, yeah. you can see that it's warm. This We're, is really warm. You're going to have, during the day, the sun hitting the grapes. And then during the night, you're going to have heat coming from the rocks up. And that's why it's possible to us to produce Passado wine. Most winemakers have an adega. It's a bit like a winery, but more homely and acts as a spot for social gatherings. So something I hadn't mentioned yet, this has been dubbed the impossible wine because of its very, very high alcohol content, all naturally achieved. Wow, that's intense. Walking around the island, it's easy to see its rich winemaking history. Over there is the role of people. So the wine barrels, they came along in the carts, along the rocks. Yeah, then they rolled it. And then it. they rolled it all the way down into the... And then they pick it and put it on the ships. And if you venture inland, you'll find miles of abandoned vineyards and crumbling lava walls. So we recovered 120 hectares. Um, it took us three years with 30 guys every day. Because you wanted to grow the almost extinct grapes in the environment that they were originally grown in. Exactly. 15 years ago, Pico's Vineyards were a museum, an open air museum. Yeah. And today it's an industry, there's uh, wine tourism coming to the island. So I think there's, there's a whole new uh, uh, era for, for Pico wines. 
10 years ago, this was all forest. Nearly all the restored vineyards are now successfully bearing fruit. And lucky for me, they're harvesting. A little bit of Arinto dos Açores. So this is a unique grape varietal in the world. Only exists here. Perfect. Good. They look lovely. And that's it. Unlike Fortunato's, the Azores Wine Company Adega is modern, built to blend in with the landscape. You can taste the, the sea. The texture of the, of the wine. Yes, you can taste the sea. The that's essence true. of the sea. And that's uh, very particular. Uh, and that's why these wines are unique. With so many people now growing grapes locally on the island, a new generation of winemakers are rising up and doing things a little differently. <laughs> Katia rents space at AWC to make wine until she can build her own adega. So what do you do differently that perhaps the others don't do? Okay, so maybe for me it's work with small quantities, not big quantities. So I try to do a little bit work with barrels, with steel tanks, um, a little bit of maceration, carbonic maceration. Mm -hmm. You're doing it your way? Yes. Now, there's just one last thing to do before I call it a night best experience that you can have in our island is you are in the adega, you sit at the table with your friends, you have the barrel right behind you. Well, and then it's very nice that you have a bed if you have too much to drink. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's it for now. Coming up next week... Ade is in Rome hunting down Italy's stolen art. Wow, this is, it's beautiful. And checks out a new museum showcasing the latest recoveries. Until then, you can catch up with some of our more recent adventures on the BBC iPlayer. We're on social media too. Just search BBC Travel Show on Facebook and Instagram and you'll find us there. In the meantime, from me and my little friend here in Mexico, safe travels and I'll see you back on the road soon. Bye. Oh, 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 oh,